let's go back and look at the Twitter example and see what we have doing with there. We went so far with it last time. We'll get so far through it today, possibly finish it up or possibly finish it up next time. Um, I'll do one review because I think it's important. I don't expect you to get everything first pass. Here is our activity. We set the content view to the activity main, which is sort of just a frame that goes around everything, one of the XML files that we have. We grab, we set the action toolbar to a toolbar that we find in the view. We grab some pointers to other things, namely the two edit fields, and then we associate a listener for them, with them, rather. The purpose of those listeners, and it's the same listener, is what? What did that listener do? The text listener in this example. Did just one thing, really. Anyone remember that? You can run it. <coughs> Try to refresh our memory. Like the build is still running. I remember it taking this long. I think it's starting the emulator is a problem because it looks like the build. Oh no, the build is still running.
sure why it's taken so long. I do not remember it taking this long in other instances. Pardon me? Yeah, I, I, I closed it and re ran it. <clears throat> oh, here we go. All right. So question was, back when we started building this an hour ago, was what does the change listener do? Because both of them have the same change to listener. What does the change listener actually do? It only does one little bitty function. curious if we remembered. Type in something there. Type in something there. Just makes the save button appear. Just right. make sure there's something in each. Right. Make sure there's something in each of them before the save button appears. So that's all the text change listener does in this case. It's a text watcher. On the text changed. It calls a method, update, save, FAB. And all that does is looks to see if both of them are empty, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. If either of them are empty, it makes the save floating action button hidden. If both of them are not empty, if, if there is something in, in both of them, uh, it sets the floating action button to visible. So that's really all that that does. Can we break that string down a little bit, the add text change listener? Sure. Um, what part of those are Java classes? What are, the, what are parts that the person wrote themselves? I, I think I understand what you mean. You mean what part of it is what part of it is code that's built into the Android classes, and which one of this is the code that Deedle or whoever wrote this wrote? Okay. Well, Deedle wrote everything in this in this class in this on create button. Find view by ID is something in the yes. It is a built-in method in uh, it's a built-in method in that. So add text change listener is something built into Yes. The These things are built in this is calling things that are built into the Android framework. Find view by ID is built into the framework. Get edit text is built into the framework. RID query text input layout is the name of our layout. All right. It's almost easier to look at what's not built in, right? If you go to the class. Right. Well, the, the other thing that is not, I guess what I'm saying is finding the control on the page is built in. The fact that a text edit field has a lister associated with it is built in. Okay? The fact that we can set that text listener, we can add a text listener to it, is built in. The specific text watcher is something that we created something a programmer created for this application. So for these four lines of code, 
really the only custom code that, that was written by the writer of this program was the code that exists in the text watcher. shows that that text watcher is declared there. Yeah. Right. So you can use that to figure out where that thing is being declared. Right. If we do that on this, it's actually telling us it's part of the framework, so it's yeah. going to pull up a decompiler. We accept that, and doesn't show you the stubs it's probably doesn't show you, yeah, doesn't show you much of anything. Um, at any rate, that's the activity class. But the fact that these controls have listeners associated with them is defined as part of the framework. The find view by ID is part of the framework. The specifics about what happens when we enter something in the text, what that watcher does is code that's going to be unique to the application. Does that make sense? I'm trying to think in a broader sense beyond this particular one. Uh, think back to the other ones where we grab the button and we set a click listener. All right, The code that finds a view by ID, that's part of the Android framework. All right, The part that says let us assign a button listener to that button, that's part of the Android framework the specific code that gets called when we click the button is specific to our application and we wrote it, if that makes sense. I think I got that part. Okay. So we're doing something similar with we're, what? We're doing very, something very similar with the text controls. Okay. We're saying we want to find the text control. All right. And we want to set the, not the click listener, because we're not interested in clicking in the, in the text control. We're interested when the text changes. So we add a text change listener to that text, edit text field. And we do the exact same thing for the other one. And what is the code that we execute? We execute the code that is found in the text watcher class, or object rather. That text watcher object is defined down here. It's one of them um, inner classes. And the function that we're interested in is on text changed. So if the text is changed in either of those fields, we look to see if we want to show or hide the button again. I have a question. So sure. In this application, they have this kind of a floating button. Mm -hmm. What's the advantage of that over just a button? Um, it's just sort of an appearance thing. I think it's just an aesthetics thing. I mean, because they could just as well have had the button, and they could have done the same thing on the text watcher to not show the button. I, I think the idea is that that doesn't clutter it, uh, and it sort of, if there was a button, it would be sort of in line with the other controls, probably be like right here. 
whereas this can sort of unobtrusively appear and disappear without messing up the rest of the layout. So that would be my guess for that. In the text watcher, they, they call update save F A B. Right. And here's where I start getting lost in Java. Um, why didn't they just do the check there to show where I did? The, the philosophy is sort of like this. They could have done the check there. But usually, usually your listeners are very skinny. Your, your listeners don't have a lot of code. They, they send the functionality elsewhere. The actual functionality goes, on, it goes elsewhere. So yeah, they could have. We could have, we could have put that in there just as well. Yeah, there might be a reason to call that from something else. Exactly. Exactly. It's broken down into components, and that's a, that's a function that's happening to the interface. This is just one way to trigger it. You're right. There could be, under other circumstances, another way that we would trigger that. Okay. Let's look at populating it. So that is the listeners up to here, to populate it. We have our save searches, which we get from shared preferences, which we pull under the ID of, of searches. We create an array list of tags from those saved searches by getting all the keys for that. If you remember, an, uh, a shared preference is a uh, an ordered pair of a key name and a value. So in our case, the key name is the tags. So these are the tags. These are what we had entered in for the tag when we saved that. So we grab all the tags, we sort them, and then we do the whole business of the recycler view and adapter. And that seems to be a little confusing. It, it, it took me a few times to sort of get the handle of it. But we create our, or we find our recycler view. We say that our recycler view, we want to simply be a linear list. We create a new search adapter. That's this guy here. We give it the tags, and we give it two functions, the item click listener and the item long click listener. So we call our search adapter, and we pass to it three things. The tags is the array list of all the tags that are going to be used to populate this recycler list, this recycler view. We also give it an item click listener. That's the code that we're going to execute when we click on one of these. And finally, the item long click listener. So each one of these items is getting the same code so that when we click on it, it does something, namely it does the Twitter search. And if we long click on it, it does something else. It pops up the menu. So we give those functions to our um, recycler views adapter. We then set the adapter of our recycler view to the adapter. And we add the item decoration, which is simply the line in between it. And we finally set the on click listener for the save button and make it visible or invisible. Let's look at the adapter. This adapter is going to ha uh, occur. This adapter is, is going to do its thing initially, when we initially load the page, as it pulls the things from the shared preferences, and every time we do some sort of editing. So the search is adapter. We create and we set the on click listener 
and the long click listener and the tags to the search adapter. So we set those arguments that got passed in to attributes of the searches adapter. We now are going to go and create And this is going to happen one for every item, once for every item in our list of tags. We're going to create a view holder for each one of these tags. Creating a view holder, first we call the onCreate view holder, which goes and it inflates the list item. If you remember, back in our XML, we had several list items. This represents one of these items. We inflate that. What we mean by inflating it is we make an actual view from that XML layout. And then we call the constructor to create and fill in that view. So this happens over and over and over again. This creates the blank item. This goes in and sets the different things of that item. We grab a pointer to the text view. We set the on click listener to the on click listeners that were passed to the adapter. We then go and say, well, I want to set the text of that text view that's part of the holder to the tags and the position in the array. So again, this gets called once for every, uh, this gets called once for every row in our list, once for every tag. This returns a number of tags. This sets the text for the particular new row that we've inserted. This makes a new row that we've inserted using the layout in the XML file. And this sets the listeners for that. Sets the listeners and grabs a pointer to the text view that is part of the new row that we've created in the recycler view. So these three, these things happen together. Each one of these functions serves a role. The item count, setting the text, inflating the layout, that is decide taking the XML and actually making the actual views from it, and finally grabbing a pointer to the text view and setting the on-click events for the item view and the long, uh, the, the click event for the item view and the long click event for the item view. So after the, this initially loads, that's what we get. When we go in and we press the save button, what happens? The on click listener of the save button kicks in. We grab the query and the tag from those two text edit text fields. We look to make sure that there's something in both those fields. We hide the keyboard. We then add the tag search, we call the method add tag search to add the query and tag to the shared preferences. Then we blank out the two text fields and set the focus back there. 
Again, your observation that you made before, could this code have been included in here? Yes, but typically we make the event listeners themselves small. So, this calls add tag search. What does add tag search do? It opens an editor to the shared preference. That's simply an object that allows us to edit the shared preferences. We go and we save the current thing in the shared preferences, and then we apply, which is sort of like a database commit that sort of finalizes the change to the shared preferences. We then look to see, is the new tag already in the list of tags? Effectively, what this is doing is this is checking to see if this is an insert or an edit, right? Because if it's an edit, then that tag's already there. If I go and edit C. Browns and I make a change here to say C. Browns 2018 and hit save, it's going to store it in the shared preferences, which is what we want to do. It's then going to look to see, gee, is C. Browns in the tags list? It is. So it won't go and regenerate that second portion of the screen because we've done an edit and this isn't an insert. So it doesn't do anything for that and doesn't refresh it at all because that new tag was already in the list of tags. In other words, what we just did was an edit. If, however, it was not in the list of tags, if I go and add something, what is a hockey team, the Cleveland Monsters, or the Lake Erie Monsters, or whatever, and save it, it took a second. It was weird. Uh, but anyhow, we get then the tag search appears there. So, if it's not in the tags, we add it to the tagged array list. We then do a sort. And we identify the adapter that the data has changed. What does that cause happen? That causes to, to, ha to happen the resetting of the adapter which means all these functions go and happen again. And it grabs the data and replaces the data with the new values for the data. Now, the implication of that, like I mentioned last time, is if we change a tag on something, It's going to act just like an insert because it's going to go, we're going to save it, it's going to look to see if the new tag is in there. So essentially we can never change a tag, right? Because if we change a tag, it's going to leave the old tag in there and it's going to create, it's going to insert the new tag. So I left A in there and then added John Adams. Yes. Does this support delete? Yes. If we if we long click on it, you can do a delete. All right. What I'd like to do now to finish up this app, and we'll either we'll either finish it today or we'll finish it next time, is to consider the two click is to Let's start with the regular click listener. All right, now we'll go to the long click listener. The regular click listener is down here. Oops. And it does something different than we've had before. That is, it starts another activity. 
Think of an activity as like being like one screen of an app. All right? Now, in this case, the app is not going to be our own app. It will either be Twitter or it will be my web browser. I did, I, I haven't done it, um, I haven't done it um, on the newest version of this app, but it behaves a little bit differently if you have Twitter installed on your device versus if you don't have Twitter installed on your device. All right? So if I click on an item, this is just a short click, what does it do? It grabs the value of the text that I clicked on. It grabs the tag. It gets past the view that I actually clicked on. So it looks for that view, and it gets the text for it and converts it to string. It then creates a URL, and it encodes the URL with the string associated with the tag. Remember, the tag is not what we're searching for in Twitter. The tag is simply our key for it. We're actually searching for the query item. So like in this case, I clicked on the tag of C. Browns. It did a look and shared preferences to see what is the string associated with the key of C. Browns. And it's actually doing the search on Cleveland Browns 2018. So we're grabbing from save searches the value, the string that's associated with that tag. And we're giving a default if it doesn't find it, search for an empty string. And we're using a character set of UTF. This is actually sort of an Xcode-ish looking feature where it puts the name of the argument and a colon and the value. Uh, that's how you code typically in Xcode when you use Swift or uh, Objective-C. It's kind of interesting that they're taking that approach to show you the value of the argument. We do a URL encode, uh, or I'm sorry, URI encode. That simply removes any special characters that might mess things up. For example, if our search had an ampersand in it. If we had an ampersand in it, uh, we have to escape that character. Um, otherwise, it's going to confuse the, the, the query that we're doing on Twitter. We then create an intent. An intent is we're asking Android to start a new activity for us. All right? So this is what we intend to start a new activity for. We want to view this URL. And we then start that activity, defined in the intent, and that's what calls the query I did that one backwards. I said CM. I should have said Cleveland Monsters. There you go. That's what does the query of Twitter. Um, the Android operating system knows what applications handle what intents. And it goes and does, opens up the appropriate application or opens up the web browser, depending on what's installed on a particular device. So that's the short click. Yep. It's its own 
own view, own activity. And how, I guess I have to experience, you know what to call it, how do you contend that I actually use several different things you can choose from? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Let's, let's Google to see what those are. That's not obvious to me why you chose Why it chose action view right. and URI. Yeah, I, I agree. every intent, when we create an intent, let's look at the constructor, that we saw a minute ago said that it is uh, an abstract thing. So in other words, you're not calling, if you had an MP3, let's say, for example, you might have a couple of different applications that play MP3s. Uh, you're just saying, I want to play this MP3. You're not saying, I want to open up the such and such audio player, right? That's your intent. Android is responsible for fulfilling the intent. And if there's any ambiguity, if there's a couple things that can handle it, it'll prompt you to say, hey, do you want to open this with app A or app B? Then it'll ask you, do you only want to do it this time or do you want to do it every time? Right. So in this one, the only thing that would distinguish this from like a, a web search would be maybe the URL itself. Yes. So in other words, and that, that's sort of what I was getting at before when I said if I had Twitter installed, yeah. it might open it up within the Twitter app as opposed to opening up within the web browser. Oh, yours is actually opening in the web browser. Yes, this is opening in the web browser. Okay, I get it. Because... So if Twitter was installed, that might become the default for anything that you're Yeah, or you would get prompted. Right. So notice, yeah, that is... No, this is, I don't think it's opening up in Twitter. This is just, yeah. This is just a Chrome browser. Yeah. I see. All right, so view could be all kinds of different. Right, right. And they have a list of actions here, which again are, are sort of abstract-ish. Yes. View, dial, view, dial, edit, view. In this case, this is talking about like uh, your contacts. So those are some things that you could do. Those could be the actions that you could do and you could give the data of the contact that you want to do. Uh, let's look. I don't know, I want to find the constructor. You can even, you can even uh, specify what kind of things your app filters for. That I want my apps to handle these sort of intents as well. It looks like they put stuff in the manifest. They do. Yeah, that in the manifest would be like how you want to handle certain, uh, certain uh, oh. intents. That's how you customize your app, yeah. I'm trying to look for the, yeah, here's the standard actions. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Pick, chooser, get content, dial, call, send, send to, answer, insert, delete, run, and so on. Okay, so you can stand, you can customize your app. And how to handle it. Into, and how to handle it, right. Right. 
you could say, for example, like the Twitter app might have, if it gets called with an action of, yeah, with an action of delete, it would go and initiate delete to delete that that person that you follow or whatever. But yeah, you could you could customize that in the in the application itself. To launch two views at once, I mean, you probably could. You want to do two things in parallel. But, well, let's say, probably the easiest way to try this is let's open this up twice. I'll bet it will allow us, and we'll have to hit back twice to get back to our app. That's my, that's my conjecture when we run this. So, yeah, I mean... At, at the same time, it's always a tough question. It will do one, then it will do the other, and then we'll have to go back twice to get to. Yeah, probably we'll do that. Yeah. I love how that bounces waiting. You should send two messages out over the internet to do two things at the same time, two different services. I'm thinking you could. Yeah. Two, two different? Yeah. Okay, so let's click on this. Now, I hit back once. Oh. Looks, like it's, uh, Looks like it just did the one. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. yeah. oh it is. It, it's interesting. The more I've, I've done with Android, the, the fascinating I find the architecture of it just how smart the architecture was, was defined. Right. Well, the way it hands off things to other apps. Right. Right. Now, what if we long click on it? If we long click on it, we get a menu that we can pick what we want to do. And that menu is to edit, delete, whatever. So if we long click on it, it grabs the value of the text view associated with that. That way it can pull up the tag or whatever. It creates an alert, alert dialog that it builds with some options. We set a title. We're setting the items. Share. Edit. Delete. I think those are the three options. And then it, it goes and displays the dialog. If, for example, we click share, it starts yet another activity. It takes our search query string, or, or URL rather, and it creates another intent, but it's a share intent. And the action is to send. Which makes sense. That's one of the common, you know, common abstract actions that an app can do. It can view something, it can send something. And there's some extra information it puts on it. Uh, and then again, it calls a create chooser, share the intent, share search to, and gives us a choice. So let's pick that one just out of curiosity. If I click share. It gives us a choice of all the things it can share. So these are, this is what you're talking about. Yeah. These are the things that can handle the send to intent. Right. So we could send it via messages. We could send it via mail. We could send it to the clipboard. We could send it through Bluetooth. We could save it. We could send it to uh, Google Drive. So those are all the things, all the apps installed here that can handle the share intent. Delete search, we have a confirmation. If they pick yes, effectively, we remove the share preferences. We remove from the share pref shared preferences that tag, apply it, and then we just tell the adapter that the, that the data has changed. 
and the adapter just goes and does its thing and recreates everything based on the new data. And finally, I think we looked at edit last time. We simply take and pop up the um, uh, pop up in the text boxes the value of the tag and the value of the query and let them go and do an edit it and do whatever they want to. And then a save either works like a update if we didn't change a tag or it works like an insert if we did change the tag. Do you happen to know what the action would be if you wanted to do instead of a long press like a swipe? That would be a different listener. Okay. okay. So let's do a Google search on that. Same idea, though. Untouch yep, untouch event. Uh, and, then you have of and then you can check that. Did they click it? Did we drag it? Did you lift up? Did that or a swipe? provides a gesture detector class for detecting common gestures. Some of it includes support, includes on down, on long press, on fling. Fling is a swipe. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. We have a gesture detector. And then we override on fling. And there's on long press is also there. On long press, yeah. What are we um, taking away from this? I'm, I'm really lost as to what it is we're trying to get out of this. Trying to get out of this example. This example, what we're trying to get out of. I would say is this, shared preferences, the fact that we can save something in shared preferences and bring it back. All right, that's number one. Number two is the fact that we can have a dynamic GUI. All right, we can have a, uh, we can inflate an XML to create views and make the GUI dynamic. In other words, there's not a predefined number of slots here. This dynamically gets created. All right. Uh, Initiating another activity by creating an event, uh, an intent, and creating that. Probably the toughest thing that we're getting, in my mind, is understanding the recycler view and the adapter for it. All right, that would be the hardest thing. The other things I think are a little more straightforward, uh, but I would say those are the four big, three or four big things. The use of the recycler view, which is associated with dynamically creating a GUI. Um, the idea of being able to have persistent data via shared preferences. And finally, um, the ability to, to, to call another activity. Those are the three big things from this, from this uh, section. There's a lot in this example. There is a lot in this example. I will try to make the homework assignments, not try to do everything that's in here, but take just take a piece of it and try to do it. So when I do the assignment for this one, uh, for next week, I will try to be a little, uh, little easier uh, on that. Or maybe that will, that's what we'll do next time.
because let's see, the next assignment is a pizza example, right? Maybe we'll spend some time talking about that and seeing what we can apply from this one to that one. Right. View. Right. But I don't, you don't need the intent. You don't need another activity. Correct. Correct. Yeah, we'll do we'll do that next time. We'll spend time looking at the next assignment and talking through what we need to do. Right. Maybe coding some of it because I think that would probably be useful and that might help answer your questions as far as what you wanted to what to get out of that and to apply for that. Landscape, I don't think works in the emulator. I remember that. I kind, I vaguely remember that before. Do you have an Android device? I do, except it's a RCA and it doesn't play well with emulators. Okay. Um, I know. Okay. Uh, I have, because uh, I recall when I was testing this, I actually ran it on a device. That's another thing I want to do is start bringing devices to lab so that you can test that. Uh, what I will do, if I run this and I can't, if I don't have a device with it, I'll just look to make sure it was coded correctly. And if you just have another, uh, again, in a nutshell, I think what you discovered, you just need another resource file. So. Yeah, with just uh, the proper resource qualifier. And Android should do the rest. Because, I mean, I've been rotating the, the emulator and it literally stays on its side or upside down. I mean, it doesn't even flop it around, you know, so it doesn't seem to handle that very well. It, it might because I I recall like it wouldn't recognize I recall when I did this a while ago it wouldn't recognize when I turned it in emulation mode but if I started off in landscape it would it would show the landscape view but again I wasn't even getting that the last when I tried it this time anything else okay that's what we'll do on Thursdays we'll